Welcome to Life-Giving Water Messages. In episode six, we concluded the six-part series of I Believe, and we discussed the resurrection of the body. This episode, episode seven, is a special episode in which I have a discussion with the Reverend Salvatore Sir Marco, who is a chaplain in a continuing care retirement community. So why don't we take a listen in and hear what Reverend Sal has to say. So uh, I have with me right now uh, Reverend Sal Sir Marco, a Presbyterian minister serving in an ecumenical, uh, what I would like to call an appointment, but actually in his terminology would be a call, uh, an ecumenical call uh, in the United Methodist Communities. He's serving in a uh, continuing care retirement community. And uh, so why don't you uh, tell us what you do? Hi, Pastor Todd. Thanks for having me. Um, So yeah, I serve as a chaplain. Uh, That is my call uh, in a continuing care retirement community, Uh, essentially as an ecumenical interfaith chaplain. Uh, I am ordained Presbyterian Church USA, uh, but I am there for all denominations. Uh, Provide, much like Pastor Todd, I, I... on occasion will preach. Mm. The majority of my work is pastoral visits, one-on-one visits, um, prayer with folks, uh, pastoral counseling, um, being in rooms at times of crisis, um, being able to respond to clinical crises mm. as a as a non-anxious presence. Um, and also as, as a clergy member there to do uh, sacraments, communion, prayer, all that stuff. All that, that good, all that that good, good stuff. Christian stuff, yeah. So, so then I guess what separates, what, what differentiates a chaplain from a pastor is that your, your focus is, is more clinical. It's, it's definitely pastoral, but more clinical. Definitely more clinical, uh, hence the term for our training is clinical pastoral education. Um, it is mostly pastoral, but it's clinical in that we train and we work in a in a, in a community that is outside the church. So it's not a church setting; it's a clinical setting in that it's a healthcare. Um, you work alongside doctors and nurses and hmm. nursing aides and uh, therapists and uh, physical therapists. So uh, you respond to more than just the spiritual issue gotcha gotcha so so it's 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 <laughs> i'd imagine a delicate balance between uh representing christ but also doing it in a way that's respectful of all of the diversity that exists around you yes in that setting yeah. and having the clinical training to help uh help you out a step back and say how am i presenting christ in the most welcoming and ecumenical or interfaith way possible interesting yeah yeah kind of like when you walk into a christian church you expect to hear jesus christ if someone's offended by hearing jesus christ in a christian church well (laughs) why are you there you know like but in your setting um you know not everybody's coming from the same place yeah so if you could explain to me, because uh, I'm not sure everybody knows what it is, could you explain a little bit for those listening what a continuing care retirement community actually is? Sure. A continuing care re- retirement community is a pretty broad uh, title for essentially what most folks would now um, think of as when they think of a nursing home. Okay. Uh, so... Continuing care, they come in. Um, I'm sure most folks are familiar with um, these senior living communities, 55 plus communities, mm-hmm. where you go in and you essentially rent an apartment or a condo. Uh, so you come into the building, buildings, uh, in, fully independent. You do your own shopping. You do, you know, you live your life as you would in in your home uh, in the community. Um, but built into the system and part of what you're paying for in your rent is as you do age and you pro- you progress through the stages of life you have available to you you basically as they say age in place so as you need more help with say your medication management you can transition to assisted living mm. uh, which is 
what it says in the name, assisted living. You, we try to keep you as independent as possible uh, with some assistance. Oh, um, makes sense. Makes sense. So we maybe knock on your door in the morning just to make sure you're okay, you haven't fallen, or we make sure your pills are laid out for you, yeah. So and you, we remind you to take your pills. But other than that, you are independent. You can do what you want, go to whatever activities you want, go to whichever church you want. Mm. From there, from Assisted Living, if you need a little bit more help, you go to Assisted Living Plus. It's the same idea, but just a more hands-on care, mm. but still with the idea of live your life, and if you need the help, we'll give it to you. From Assisted Living Plus, there are two roads you can take. They essentially end up in the same place, but two roads you can take. Uh, one side is our memory support unit. Our, we, for us at the Methodist communities, it's called Tapestries. Mm. Uh, it is a dementia care unit, so the folks with Alzheimer's, any other type of memory impairment, mm. um, they will be sent to that unit. It's a locked unit. Uh, stuff is very, their activities are very structured very much geared to the fact that they won't, maybe don't necessarily remember who they are or who you are, um, mm. but they can thrive. And it's locked in the sense that, that they can't get out. So they can walk around the area, the area that wing, so to speak, but they can't get out and, and get lost. Possibly yeah. get lost or mm -hmm. end up out of the community. Uh, and then the other option is our long-term care unit which has a couple aspects to it. It has a subacute rehab. So uh, some folks might be familiar with if uh, their grandparent or their parent has had a hip replacement or a knee replacement or some hospital stay that requires a little bit of rehab, just a little bit of tweaking before mm -hmm. they can go home. They come into our subacute rehab, um, which is full 24-hour nursing care, um, very much all of their care is dictated by the hospital, so we kind of follow their doctor's orders to get mm. them rehabbed, rehabilitated. The other two wings of that unit are what we call long-term care. They are uh, skilled nursing areas, so mm. there's 24-hour nursing care as well as uh, nurses' aides and activities folks who, mm. um, in a sense, it is like memory support, and it's um, a locked unit. Mm -hmm. It's not specifically locked, but it's, you know, for folks who we don't want to wander, we, they can right. make sure they they don't wander off. They're, and everything is taken care of for. There's, you know, doctors who round every week. Mm. It's, uh, is, that is the most, out of all of our, our wings or our units, that is the most clinical. Okay. That is the most hospital-like. Okay. Uh, if you were to walk in a room, you say, oh, this looks like a hospital room. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but they can still have some of their own belongings in the room. Gotcha. And and I guess out of out of all of the areas at, at uh, a, a CCRC, a continuing care retirement community, that's the one that that fits the nursing home. <clears throat> that's what that's perception. when when folks' perception when they move in is, I don't want to go to the nursing home. Well, that's that would be the unit that they want to go to, and that uh, a lot of my Counseling is around the areas of, well, I don't want to move to that unit yet because if I move to that unit, well, I'm either going to be a vegetable or I'm mm. going to die. Mm. Which which Ooh. brings us right into uh, what I want to ask you because uh, being that this is where people go to spend the end of their, their days, the last of their days uh, in life, whether they be fully independent or somewhere on that, uh, that sliding spectrum, so to speak, um, they go there knowing that this is where more than likely they're going to spend the rest of their life. And so I'm imagining in that setting you deal with death just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> um, quite a lot, actually. Yeah. Um, we have a... Healthcare chaplains have a... We can tend to have... Well... Folks may perceive our sense of humor, humor as morbid, uh, <laughs> but when you deal with death, you have to find a way to cope with it. Uh, but we often will will notice or joke or that you know throughout the year you will see ebbs and flows of life and death, mm. uh, especially uh, around holidays. Mm. So like from east from Thanksgiving to Christmas, and say from. Through, throughout Lent to Easter, you will, you'll notice a, a, a spike 
in deaths. Um, and we do keep track of those numbers. Sure. Um, so this last between Thanksgiving and uh, January 1st of this year, um, we lost 16 residents. Wow, 16. Um, which is a, it's a high for us. Mm. And uh, our Easter, although knock on wood, our <laughs> Easter season is not over yet. We've, we've lost about five folks. Wow, wow. Um, whether they be long-term residents or subacute rehab. So 16 folks. during the Advent Christmas season, mm-hmm. and you've lost five so far during the, Lent. during the Lent, which is coming close to an end, but you yes. don't want to definitely knock on wood on that. Um, so you deal with death quite a bit, and, and I'd imagine you don't just deal with... Um, I mean, you obviously deal with the deaths of those who are living at your uh, facility, the residents, uh, but do you, what other kinds of deaths do you see there? We see all types. Um, I would say on an average in a year, I average about 10 funerals that I officiate, 10 right. services. Which is deceiving because you don't officiate every funeral. Yes, I don't officiate right. every funeral in our um, one of the great things about chaplaincy is I have relationships with other clergy and I often will encourage folks to um, use their own clergy Mm -hmm. if they can Um, but we also deal with you know we have employees who either pass away or deal with death in their own life so while I may not necessarily officiate that service I often do a lot of the grief work around that Mm -hmm. because other than being at home with their families, a lot of their time is spent with their work families. Sure, sure, yeah, and and uh, like you, you also said that sometimes it's not even. Um, well, I don't know if you said this, but sometimes it's not even physical death, but death in a lot of different ways. Yeah, um, death uh, comes at us in a multiple ways. Uh, there's a song, Christian artist Jason Gray has a song called "Death Without a Funeral." Mm. Uh, you know, death is a uh, we as humans, we grieve for things that we lose. Mm. So, and the, I count those as deaths. So, maybe I know myself personally, and other folks have gone through the death of divorce. Mm. Folks have gone through the death of a business or the death of a church community mm. uh, that has had to close. Um, so, any relationship, any relationship that comes to an end, whether it's with a person, a pet. Mm. Um, an institution um, when that when that thing ends whether tragically or not that's a death that you have to deal with and you will grieve sure sure so you, you so you deal with death on a whole bunch of different levels wise spectrum yeah yeah and and uh, you help um, not just the residents but uh, in, in the uh, what you call the associates the employees uh, the staff the management um, and uh, sometimes family members who are visiting their families and aren't dealing with a death there, but something's going on in their lives, and I'm sure you, you help them with that. Let me ask, this moves me to, to the next question I want to ask you. Um, as as a, somebody who's dealt with death so much, um, what is the most difficult, difficult death you have dealt with? And I, I'm sure you could probably pick a whole uh swath of them uh but if you had to put your finger on one what would you say <laughs> yeah, can i say everyone sure Every death. <laughs> definitely um they all do i mean uh with any any grieving they take a toll um you have to manage that you're grieving responsibly but if i were to put my finger on one i can put my finger on a couple but one recent one and uh, Todd had had the honor of knowing this person as well. Mm. Um, was a longtime resident uh, and supporter of the Methodist communities. He was also uh, active in leadership in the the Methodist conference. Um, he was a big supporter, even though I am one of those chosen frozen <laughs> Presbyterians. <laughs> chosen frozen, working for the Methodists. Um, one of the first times I had to preach in chapel to cover for a pastor who couldn't make it. Um, this person came up and shook my hand and said, yep, you're a Presbyterian. (laughs) And that was his way of saying, good job. You preached the gospel. Well, you were prepared. Um, and then from that point on, he 
uh, often silently, but very actively supported my ministry and my calling to that place, even though I wasn't mm. a Methodist. Uh, so the the day that he passed, uh, uh, without giving too much away, uh, Todd was involved that day as well. Yes, um, yeah, I remember this day quite well. Quite well. Uh, we were called to his room because he was, it was discovered that he passed in his apartment. Um, so it was like losing a mentor. Mm. Um, and that was uh, uh, our executive assistant uh, saw me coming back from that visit because she had let us know or someone had let us know. And she said, so what's going on? And I said, he's gone. Mm. And she could see that I was welling up with emotion. So she whisked me into the conference room and I sat down and just the floodgates opened and I was quivering like a like a baby and saying it was it was hard and she you know when people see you grieving they immediately want to fix it of course and, uh, there's something wrong with Jack wrong. <laughs> Sorry. no there's nothing wrong I'm just <laughs> grieving uh, right. but she wanted to help and I said just just let me let me sob this one out mm, mm. so she closed the door and I cried it out yeah so. yeah that was i i you're right I, I remember that that day very well and it was it was tough it was not what i was there expecting to do mm-hmm. <laughs> i was there expecting to do a couple of visitations well i did do a visitation <laughs> but it wasn't the one i expected we're, we're expecting it, so. yeah and um I, I was uh honored to serve with you and to have you there uh with that but uh yeah that was that was difficult that was really difficult and uh what people don't realize is that pastors um we we may have our theology we may be trained in theology and we may be able to think through death and think through intellectually think through things um in that way uh because we're trained to but at the core of who we are we're people mm-hmm. we're broken people clinging on to what hope we have mm-hmm. um and yeah, you know, and, and so that was that was tough. That was really tough. We we may have the resources to vocalize the grief and the theology around death. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that we don't grieve that death any less or any more than the next our parishioners or our the next person. That's right. Um I you know, folks will often say, you know, pray for your clergy. Um when they say that Pray for your clergy, whether it's a chaplain or a pastor. <laughs> please do. Yeah. Please do. Yeah. Um, you know, you learn in chaplaincy that there's the thing called boundaries, and you try to keep boundaries. And obviously, I'm not going to tell everyone, or Pastor Todd's not going to tell every congregant what's going on. But if you think that your pastor is grieving or is angry or is sad, uh, you're right. <laughs> they are. Um, go with your gut. Go with your gut. <laughs> That's right. Follow your heart. <laughs> um, give them space to grieve. Yeah. But also be available as a non, non-anxious present, just to be there in the moment. And that's what chaplaincy is, is, being able to be there in the moment and let someone grieve without trying to fix it. Mm, without trying to fix it, yeah. That's, uh, you can't, you can't to... fix grief. Yeah. yeah. You can just uh, help someone ride it out. Um, I don't know that you ever fully write it out either, right, yeah. but, uh, yeah. So that brings us rather than, uh, keeping this as a dirge, <laughs> uh, let us, let us bring a little hope into the conversation. Uh, what is it for you as somebody who deals with death regularly, somebody who has to grieve with people and walk people through their grief? Uh, uh, what is it about the resurrection? Because, um, this this whole this is this whole interview is coming on the heels of a six part series on uh, the creed the apostles creed I believe, and so this uh, this the, today's message was actually on the resurrection of the body. So, what is it about the resurrection that gives you, Chaplain Sal, Presbyterian extraordinaire? <laughs> uh, what is it about the resurrection that gives you hope? You know we. We as Presbyterians, and I'm sure Methodist is similar, but as Presbyterians, we, even though we kind of, uh, in layman's terms, we'll say it's a celebration of life when we do a funeral, right? Which it is. Yeah. Uh, the l- actual wording we use in the liturgy is: "This is a witness to death 
and the resurrection. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in the um, Methodist Church, it's a, a service of death and resurrection. It's the same um, basic principle. What the resurrection tells me is that the story is not over. Mm. Um, you know, if you look at the scripture and you look at the Gospels, and I, at least at least for Luke and John uh, that I can remember, with the gospel, with the empty tomb, um, when Mary and in John, it's Mary and Peter. The Mary is in Peter. Mm. And James, I think. But anyway, in the, Luke, in the Luke version, Mary goes to the tomb and can't find Jesus. Mm. <laughs> and uh, so the angels say he's not here. Yeah. Why, are you, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Yes. Yeah. Um, so in, in youth group, that got translated into he is not here. The story continues. Mm. Um, but what I, I cling to, and I've preached this a couple of times, either at the, the, commu- the retirement community or the hospital, um, I really cling to, as a pastor and as a chaplain, the, the, the John mm. account of the, God, of the empty tomb. You know, the, the Marys show up early to uh, prepare the body and to properly bury it, and it's gone. It's It's gone, and so... Mary in her her grief. And this is Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene yep. mm-hmm. in her grief uh, is crying, and she turns around and Jesus shows up, but she doesn't know that it's Jesus. Mm-hmm. She thinks it's the gardener, um, <laughs> and so I can just picture her pounding on his chest, saying, "Where did you take him? Where is he?" And he says one simple thing. He says, "Mary." Mm-hmm. He claims her. Mm, he claims her, yeah. And in that moment, she realizes, oh my goodness, this this is Jesus. Mm. And I can just picture it as a movie. She gives him a bear hug and is crying and says, you know, don't leave me. Don't leave me. But what does Jesus tell her to do? Mm. Go. Go and tell my disciples. Yeah. Yeah. Um, go and share the, the good news. Yeah. Um, so, and that's, that's the gospel story is that death is not the final word. Mm. And it is so powerful and so, such good news that Jesus says to Mary, go, go, go yeah. and tell. Yeah. Um, it's great. You've experienced this, but it doesn't stop with you. Go and tell other people that this has happened. Yeah. That I am the resurrection. Had, had Mary not done that. We could not have the experience with Thomas in the upper room mm. saying, I will not believe it till I see the wounds in his hands. And Jesus says, here you go. Here you go. <laughs> That's, right. That's right. And Thomas's response is, my God, my Lord. Right. I always, it always irks me because you see the pictures of Thomas putting his hands in the wounds, but that's not what happened in the story. In the story, Jesus says, here you go, put your hands, put your fingers in my wounds. And Thomas just drops to his knees and goes, my Lord and my God. So he, at that moment, nothing else mattered. He didn't need the proof anymore. He believed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's powerful. Um, so, so the gospel story is a powerful one. And it's, um, I heard recently, my wife and I have begun, have been attending a, a, an Episcopal church recently. And so last year was the the 12th, gospel, 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, where Jesus basically says, you know what, I'm going to have to die. Mm. And his disciples are like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah. We, we don't get it. You notice his disciples don't get a lot of things. <laughs> they don't get it. This is true. <laughs> this is true. Uh, so his disciples, his the apostles don't really get it. But he's like, I have to I have to die. Mm. And so this, this pastor said, you know, to know Jesus, you have to look death in the face. Mm. You know, I do it every day for a living. Doesn't make it easier, but every day that I walk with someone to to the point of death, I see Jesus. Mm. Um, I liked, you know, uh, there's a there's a quote from Martin Luther. He says. When the devil throws your sins in your face and tells you you deserve death and hell, Mm. tell him 
What of it? <laughs> I've got Jesus Christ who won my satisfaction. Uh, yeah. Yeah. What of it? I love that Martin Luther. He just like yeah, stick yeah. it right in your face. Yeah. <laughs> um, a little German drunken monk. Wow. Death is not the end. No, death is not the end. Uh, death does not have the final word. The cross, Jesus Christ, uh, who died on the cross, is the final word. Holds the keys to hell and death and says, I'll have none of it. <laughs> I'll have none of it. And I, I'm honored and blessed that as a chaplain, and I'm sure Todd as a pastor, as we get to walk folks, and often it is my job to lead folks to an empty tomb yeah yeah amen amen well i think that's a good place to to leave it um i really thank you for joining me uh today uh, uh sal and uh helping me uh kind of uh unpack the resurrection a little bit if you will through your story and i think it's great to hear you know we don't always get to see what it's like to be a a, um, a chaplain or a pastor and so these these little opportunities give people a, a window into that but also point us to something greater the reason you do what you do and the reason i do what i do is because we have the hope of the resurrection within us uh, there would be no reason for me to sit here across from you and for you to be sitting there across from me talking about this if we didn't have that hope and so um I would just like to uh, invite people, you know, to into that hope of the resurrection. You don't need proof; you just need belief. Um, and if you're longing for for meaning and purpose and uh, and a hope that that surpasses all hopes, the resurrection's where it's at. The resurrection's where it's at. And so, uh, why don't we close with prayer? Gracious and loving God, I just uh, thank you for. Uh, Chaplain Sal and his ministry uh, as, a, as a chaplain in a CCRC. I thank you for his willingness to make himself vulnerable uh, every day with people who are struggling and grieving, people who are, who are walking their journey, their final journey toward, toward death. Lord, we know that in you there is no death, and so that, that we who are alive and face the unknown can be certain of this, that you have conquered death, that you have risen from the grave, and that in you lies the resurrection of our bodies as well, one that we can begin living into now and one that we will experience in all of its fullness when that day comes where we are joined with you forever and ever in eternal life. We pray these things in thanksgiving and in joy in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. And so that concludes the discussion that Reverend Sal Sarmarco and I had regarding the resurrection and the hope that lies in the resurrection. It is an eternal hope. And so in that vein, I hope that you will come and, and uh, that you will tune in next week and listen to the Easter Sunday message where we will celebrate the resurrection of the Lord in which we stand and in which we live and in which we serve. Until then, my friends, Peace be with you. May the grace of God be upon you, and may love ever fill you and overflow from you into the world. God bless. Mm-hmm.